Hello, everyone. Good evening. Can you hear me? Oh, yeah. Hi, oh. welcome. Welcome to the History Center. My name's Nicole Smith. Uh, it's great to see so many out tonight to support Alex. Uh, just a couple announcements before I turn it over to her. Um, if you're watching from home, you're welcome to put any comments for the speaker in the chat or comments on Facebook. Uh, this webinar is being recorded and will be available on the York County History Center YouTube channel after today. A um, couple upcoming programs here. Our second Saturday speaker is Bob Lee. He'll be speaking about the history of laundry from the 1700s to 1940s. It's probably fascinating. Um, <laughs> on August 17th is our uh, monthly Civil War Roundtable. Speaker is Scott Mingus, and he'll be speaking about his latest book, Unceasing Fury, Texans at the Battle of Chickamauga. On August 24th will be the seventh anniversary of all that's, and the speaker will be Bill Rosevere, and I'm speaking about his time in Vietnam. And so now I'd like to welcome Alex Kelly, who will speak about her experience in Desert Storm. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Alex Kelly. I'm a Persian Gulf War veteran and one of 40,000 women who made up the largest deployment of women in the combat at that time leading to the expansion of combat roles for women in all branches of the military. Originally from Philadelphia, I have lived in York County for the past 48 years and graduated from York High in 1989. I have been married to my husband, Terry, a combat veteran of Operation Just Cause for 24 years, and we have a 20-year-old son, James. Professionally, I have a master excuse me, a bachelor's degree in nursing, a master's in business administration, and a master's degree in nursing with a specialty of family nurse practitioner. And I worked throughout York, Adams, and Lancaster counties as a hospice nurse practitioner, helping others through the final stage of life. It is my hope after tonight, you'll have a better understanding of some of the challenges females face in the military. I enlisted in the Pennsylvania Army National Guard as a supply specialist with Detachment 1, 131st Transportation Unit in York, Pennsylvania, a few days after turning 18. I spent eight years in the Guard with one year on active duty in support of Operation Desert Shield and Storm. At our monthly drill in July 1990, leadership from Fort Indian Town Gap informed us our primary mission had changed from Germany to the Middle East and Germany was relegated to our secondary mission. On August 2nd, 1990, Iraq invaded Kuwait and in the fall, my guard unit asked for volunteers to go to Saudi Arabia and I volunteered. However, it turned out to be a moot point because shortly thereafter, the unit was mobilized and on October 12th, went to Fort Indian Town Gap, where we joined the 131st Transportation Company from Williamsport for a month of training, immunizations, obtaining supplies and equipment and getting our equipment ready. The detachment had two women and 56 men. Once we joined our mother company at Fort Indian Town Gap, we had a total of seven women and 152 men deployed to Saudi Arabia, and I was one of those seven. One day at the gap, it was raining and the end of a long day. As another female and I headed back to the barracks, discussing the enormity of the situation we were about to face, were we facing another Vietnam? Would we need the chemical warfare training we received? And as the other female simply commented, I wonder when we'll see rain again. She linked her arm in mine and said, let's go. And we jumped in mud puddles and hooped and hollered, letting off some much needed steam. 
However, our antics were witnessed by a senior NCO who pulled us aside, stating we were going to war. Did we understand the gravity of the situation and could we be counted on overseas? What I didn't say out loud, but thought to myself, how many times did this staff sergeant, as well as a few others, tell me women didn't belong in the military? And if I ever used my monthly cycle as an excuse to get out of work, I would need to show physical proof of it. So how did he think I felt deploying with him? Would he have my six? Fortunately, since our arrival at the Gap, I fell under headquarters with a different chain of command. This wasn't my only concern as a female getting ready to deploy to a combat zone. I experienced sexual harassment and assault throughout my eight years in the military. How did I handle it? Some of it I chose to ignore. Some of it I addressed myself. And one incident occurred as we readied ourselves for deployment, which I had to take to my commander who swiftly handled it. 55% of women and 38% of men seeking care through the VA experience sexual harassment and assault in the military. However, those numbers do not include women and men seeking care outside the VA in the private sector. To give you an example of what females have to deal with in the military, here's a quick story. While training at the Gap, for our deployment, I had the opportunity to fire a 50 cal machine gun. While waiting my turn as the only female in line, very loudly a senior NCO yelled, Valenti, you have to charge it the same as the men if you want to fire it, no exceptions. In order to charge a 50 cal, you have to use your right hand and underhandedly pull the charging handle back. At 19, I was already tired of proving myself so I harnessed all the frustration and anger I had into grabbing that charging handle and I charged that SOB better than most of the men and earned quite a bit of a few surprise looks. My guard unit was the only one in Pennsylvania at that time with a C1 readiness rating, meaning we had to mobilize in 30 days or less. We departed the GAF and arrived at McGuire Air Base in New Jersey on November 11th to fly to Saudi Arabia. As many of you know, hurry up and wait is the unofficial motto of the Army. While waiting to leave, we played cards, napped, and just hung out. Finally, without warning, we received the command to board the plane, and a bit of general chaos ensued. As I scrambled to put on my boots and grab my gear, a colonel from the 28th Division at the Gap saw me and made me laugh by gently and good-naturedly saying, don't worry, they won't leave without you. Shortly after departing McGuire, we sustained engine failure and did an emergency landing in Boston, Massachusetts. But due to security reasons, we were not allowed off the plane until the new one arrived eight hours later. After stopping at an air base in Spain for refueling, we finally landed in Saudi Arabia on November 12th. We stayed in migrant housing at the port of Al-Dhamam, and once in Saudi Arabia, fell under the 22nd Support Command. 22nd Support Command is only activated during wartime, and during Desert Storm was comprised of approximately 73% reservists and guardsmen. The 22nd Support Command not only shaped the mass of U.S. buildup, it ultimately helped orchestrate the left hook that eventually expelled Iraqi forces from Kuwait. Some of the challenges of deploying is packing. We were allowed two duffel bags, but uniforms, boots, mop suits, and other required gear didn't leave much time for anything else. Obviously, you cannot pack everything you need in two bags for a three-month tour, but complicating things, we had our orders extended twice in theater. Females have unique monthly needs that men don't, and you cannot pack that many supplies. We had to adapt. All of us women had our relatives mail us the essential products, which we put on a shared table so we could grab what we needed. 
while the armed forces exchange system did set up post exchanges to support the troops, they were not everywhere and did not always have contain essentials and never female essentials. The army provided sundry boxes with soap, shaving cream and candy, but again, nothing for female soldiers. The army did supply me with birth control pills, but not my prescription, which led to multiple monthly needs and severe pain. On a particularly painful day, I had had enough and lay down in the prone position, holding my stomach on a metal container and fell asleep. I worked alongside another female and three married males, so they understood and probably preferred me asleep at that moment. I'm not sure how long I slept, but the next thing I knew, I had the four of them excitedly shaking me awake. They were talking over each other and very animate. Turned out a two-star general walked into our office and when they turned to wake me up, he stopped them and said, I have daughters, let her sleep. He gave them each a challenge coin and one for me, my first. In the meantime, my mother contacted my physician who gave her almost a year's worth of medication and wishes for my safe return. Around Thanksgiving, President Bush was due to arrive in country for a visit and we were asked if we would like to meet him. I signed up thinking no way would a private first class be picked, but it turned out only the lower enlisted signed up. After speaking, President Bush made his way into the crowd to speak to the troops. He was very close to me, but I had a hard time, <clears throat> excuse me, moving through the crowd because I was surrounded by officers. As President Bush was moving away, I gave it everything I had. I reached through the crowd and I pulled him off balance to me. He kindly turned and smiled at me. I asked for a photo and he said yes and asked where my camera was. I replied, I don't know, sir. But as fate would have it, some soldier I never met and had no recollection of giving him my camera said I have it. President Bush put his arm around me and said, let's turn that way. And I got my picture. He was the true definition of a class act. After that, I politely made my way to Barbara Bush and got my photo with her too. Sometime later, unbeknownst to me, my father had the photo enlarged and mailed it to her. She personalized it to me saying, thank you from all of America and signed it. Also, without my knowledge, my mother wrote a letter to the first lady telling her how I and America should not be at war. The first lady sent a short but poignant letter back sharing how she remembered her concerns when George was a Navy fighter pilot in World War II and encouraged her to reach out to friends and family for support. The picture and letter are framed and hang proudly in my home. Unless we needed supplies, I rarely left the compound. I started going a little stir crazy since I wasn't always the one to go on the supply runs. And even though I was 19, I knew I was having a once in a lifetime experience and I wanted to do and see as much as possible. I went to our dispatcher and told a small white lie telling him that first sergeant said I needed my driver's license. Because up until that point, I had drivers assigned to me for supply runs who also doubled as my escorts. This led to me driving for some of the supply runs and leading a convoy driving a Chevy Blazer on a transport mission to Riyadh where I saw my first camels. It should be noted that even though I started driving, I still required a male escort when I left the compound and later our camp in the desert because even though I was an American soldier, I was a woman. Another time, I snuck out of the compound and went to the neighborhood corner store. While there, I felt compelled to purchase a local newspaper and was quite surprised to find an article and pictures of my National Guard unit leaving Fort Indian Town Gap for McGuire Air Base. After three months in port, we moved in waves to Log Base Echo in the desert. Log Base Echo was one of several supply depots devised by General Pagonis that were strategically placed near the front line instead of being placed far behind combat forces as traditionally done. I was in headquarters and moved last on January 31st. Needless to say, it was extremely dark as we were led to our tent 
So we could not see anything outside the flashlight's range. I woke up the next morning on my 20th birthday, stepped outside to a perfectly sunny day and could see nothing but desert for miles, which was quite jarring. We were 10 kilometers from Iraq and the ground war start, and after the ground war started, I sat outside on the tailgate of a deuce and a half and watched it. It was a surreal moment realizing I was most likely watching people die and praying they were not ours. While in the desert, I had the most incredible toothache and had to go to sick call along with a few males from my unit, all for wisdom teeth. When I signed in, there were over half a dozen pages of nothing but wisdom teeth listed. After signing in, I was sent to the female only waiting room. Despite my efforts to stay with the males and being an American soldier, I had to comply with the Saudi Arabian hospital rules. I was the only American and dressed in fatigues in a room of burqa clad women and their children. All conversation in the room stopped and we sat in silence as they stared at me until I was called to be seen. The American army dentist said, the good news is your tooth is impacted, but the bad news is that the others most likely are too. And you'll just be back here in a week or two. So all four are coming out today. I received 11 shots of Novocaine. He placed his knee between my legs, supported his hand on my face, and took all four out. Wow. <laughs> After it was over, I was sent to the women's only pharmacy and received my prescription for Motrin. <laughs> <laughs> Since none of us received sutures or packing, there were five of us hanging over a wall, letting the blood run out of our mouths, waiting for our driver to take us back to camp. While at Log Base Echo, my unit acquired materials to build showers out of a Connex container. Women had one hour out of 24 to get showers with the other 23 reserved for the men. Not a big deal since they are more than than us, unless you weren't in that camp in that hour. Luckily, we also had plastic bins usually reserved for hand washing our clothes, but in a pinch doubled as an alternative to a shower. Being in the desert required more and larger supply runs. Some of headquarters rarely left the camp, but I went on as many excursions as possible. I started driving deuce and a half trucks fairly regularly, learned to double clutch, and drove a tractor trailer on a trip or two. On one of the runs, we had to stop at a fueling location in the middle of nowhere. And while waiting, I hear Alex, Alex Valenti, I turned around and had quite the surprise seeing my battle buddy from basic training in AIT Barb, a reservist from Utah. We hugged, jumped around, and briefly caught up with one another. Another memorable moment included going into the nearest town, Hafer al Batin, with a few male escorts. During one trip, a local man, accompanied by his wife, tried to buy me as wife number two or three. My escorts joked with him, trying to get a fair price, but it quickly became apparent the man was serious. They followed us and we ended up running like in the movies, ducking in and out of businesses where we watched them run by and we quickly went the other way, finally losing them. Often when we traveled, I'd be the only female in the group, which presents challenges such as when the convoy has to stop to relieve themselves. I'd stay in the vehicle until they were done, then I duck under part of the truck, blocking me from the unit, but exposing myself to the locals as they drove by beeping and waving at me. <laughs> I did the only thing I could do. I smiled and waved back. One time I was fortunate enough to have one of the guys offer to hold up a blanket so I was blocked from the unit and the locals. After the ceasefire, we had the opportunity to go to Kuwait and view the aftermath. It was the middle of the day, but it was dark because of the oil field fires, and there was a ton of unexploded ordnance on the roadside. The destruction was incredible, but the most memorable thing about Kuwait were its citizens and children's overwhelming gratitude. The Kuwaiti man gave me a Kuwaiti flag sticker with a handwritten thank you note on the back. Finally, 
After months in the desert, we received word we were leaving the desert to prepare to go home. We left the desert and went to Kobar Towers in Kobar, Saudi Arabia, where we finally had real bathrooms and bathtubs. While at Kobar Towers, a few guys rented cars to check out the town. And of course, I wanted to do that too. However, Saudi Arabia did not allow women to drive at that time. Driving military vehicles was one thing, but to rent a car, I had to ask one of the males to rent it for me and escort me when I drove. I can still see the local women laughing, pointing and slapping their knees, seeing me get out of the car, realizing I was a woman. When Saudi Arabia changed their laws several years later to allow women to drive, I couldn't help but think of those women and hope they or their daughters were now driving too. Before we left Saudi Arabia, the unit asked for volunteers to stay on active duty stateside. And once again, I volunteered and stayed on active duty for an additional five months at Fort Indian Town Gap. One thing that was not discussed and I was not prepared for when I left Saudi Arabia was the potential for PTSD, which I experienced the first few months when I returned home. My PTSD was triggered by loud noises and sirens, which were reminiscent of the chemical alarms, air raid sirens, and Patriot missiles launching to intercept Scud missiles. This occurred one time while I was driving, causing me to slightly go off road. I was fortunate that my PTSD slowly went away on its own. However, many veterans continue to experience PTSD many years and decades after returning home. The VA reports 12% of Gulf War, Iraqi freedom, and Afghanistan veterans, and 15% of Vietnam veterans had PTSD. Again, those numbers do not include veterans seeking health care in the private sector. If you or someone you know has PTSD, there are many resources for help, and I encourage you to please reach out. Another issue that arose immediately upon returning home was I was a homeless veteran. I had broken my lease and put my belongings in storage when I deployed. I spent the first few nights home either on my father's couch or at a friend's house. Eventually I secured housing at Fort Indian Town Gap. After leaving active duty at the Gap, the friend I crashed with when I returned home allowed me to live with her until I was once again able to get my own apartment. It's hard to get the exact figures on, excuse me, veteran homelessness, but veterans are more likely to be homeless than civilians. And according to one source in 2019, 21 out of every 10,000 veterans are homeless. Fortunately, I had one person willing to let me move into their extra room, or I'm not quite sure what I would have done. Also after leaving active duty, I was called into the office and informed my guard unit was transitioning to combat engineers and would be an all male unit. I had the option to join a unit at the Gap and continue monthly drills with the unit, transfer or discharge. I opted to transfer to company C, 328th FSB in Lancaster and became a medic for my remaining time. While at drill, I met my husband, the only other combat veteran in the company. I only had a handful of friends, none of whom served. So it was nice to have someone to talk to about the military and deployment. While deployed, my mother had to contact the college admissions office to inform them I was deployed and had my enrollment deferred twice. When I finally started college, I felt like the odd duck because I was 20 years old and taking classes with 18 year olds straight out of high school. So I joined Chi Gamma Iota, a co-ed military fraternity, but I was the only combat veteran. So I recruited another veteran to enroll in college and join the fraternity too, my future husband, Terry. So again, it was just the two of us. For many years, I didn't talk about my experiences and most people didn't know I was a veteran, let alone a combat veteran. Then I joined Facebook and started looking for Desert Storm groups and pages. 
Nothing sat well with me until Facebook suggested the Desert Storm Combat Women's page to me in 2018. While on it, the women were talking about a parade and a memorial. I had no idea what they were talking about. So I asked, what parade? What memorial? Every year since 2016, hundreds of Desert Storm veterans march in the National Parade on Memorial Day in Washington, D.C. to raise awareness for the future National Desert Storm War Memorial to be built on the corner of 23rd and Constitution to honor and forever memorialize the 383 fallen women and men of Operations Desert Shield and Storm. It was at that time I started acknowledging my veteran status. In 2018, I signed up and went to DC and marched in my first parade as a proud Desert Storm veteran. Shortly after the parade, I joined the VFW in New Freedom, which started my involvement in the veteran community as a volunteer and advocate. Acknowledging my veteran status and becoming involved in the veteran community came with an unexpected realization that many people assume that it is the man, not the woman, who is the veteran. Both my husband and I have veteran tags and he's always thanked for his service. Even when he's not with me, people will say, thank your husband for his service. A few years ago, we went to our first Veterans Day breakfast at the York Fairgrounds without, <clears throat> excuse me, without wearing anything indicating we were veterans. And they handed my husband a ribbon and said, thank you. To his credit, he did not acknowledge his service but said, you may want to give this to her. Those are only two of way too many examples I can give you. Part of what I did to start correcting this misconception was getting a personalized Persian golf license plate that reads woman. I wear a Desert Storm veteran, woman's veterans hat and multiple veteran t-shirts. It's helped, but still occurs way too often. It is okay and preferred by women veterans everywhere to not assume, but ask which one of you is the veteran. In February, 2019, I was the volunteer coordinator for the National Desert Storm War Memorial site dedication at 23 in Constitution, where I met Vice President Dick Cheney and General Horner, who oversaw the air assault. And just this past July 14th, we ceremoniously broke ground to start construction of the memorial with the goal of completion by Veterans Day 2024. Most people do not realize it, but not one cent of taxpayer money goes towards the construction of war memorials. All funds are raised through grassroots efforts. One of the many ways we've raised money for the memorial is through beer. Captain Jack was the first Marine killed when the helicopter he was piloting crashed on February 2nd, 1991, and he liked beer. His daughter grew up to own a brewery in Texas and brews Captain Jack in honor of her father with all proceeds benefiting the memorial. The only way to get Captain Jack in your area is to have a brewery apply and receive approval to brew it. I spoke to many brewery managers and owners and sent countless emails and Facebook messages. Finally, I received notification in 2019 that Stony Run Brew House in North Pennsylvania, after receiving my email, applied and was approved to brew Captain Jack. They were and are the only brewery in Pennsylvania brewing it. And the New Freedom VFW, where I was the first female officer in their 77 year history, was the first VFW in the world to serve <coughs> Captain Jack. Through acknowledging my service, the National Parade, and my work as a Desert Store War Memorial Ambassador, I've been blessed to meet the most extraordinary people and veterans. Amy Jo Morris, Marines, Glen Hope Care Farm. Tracy Young, Marines, on Common Ground. Bruce Bartz, Bartz Brigade. Bill Fallon, Air Force, your county veterans network. 
Terry Gendron, Army, York County Department of Veterans Affairs, and the most amazing veterans who I call my tribe and my family, especially my A gunner, Carmel Jenko, US Army retired. I recently joined the American Legion and became the first female veteran rider of the American Legion Riders Chapter 403 in Glen Rock, who raised money for and support a variety of veteran causes. I would be remiss not to mention the amazing hospice organization I am blessed to work for, Hospice and Community Care, who has a veterans program which recognizes veterans through, for their service through a special pinning ceremony, which I've watched and also had the honor of pinning a veteran. Additionally, each member of the Hospice and Community Care's clinical team received training on the unique needs of the veteran population to better meet their individual needs. Veterans are a different breed of people, and sometimes it takes another veteran to make a connection. One of our social workers reached out to me, telling me he had a veteran patient who happened to be a Desert Storm veteran who would not engage with him or other members of the team beyond basic answers and wanted me to be aware because I was seeing him later in the week. The first time I met him, I said, I've been waiting to meet you. I heard you're a Desert Storm veteran, I am too. We spent the next several moments talking about the military and discovered we went to the same high school and knew some of the same people. Then I was able to ease into the conversation and have a meaningful and productive visit about how he was doing and what he needed from us. Tonight, I shared some good and not so good moments of being in the military, but please know the people who encouraged me and had my back far outnumber those who didn't. I love the military and like many like me, wish I would have stayed in longer. It gave me opportunities to do things and meet people I never would have otherwise. My husband, the president, the first lady, the vice president, two ambassadors to Kuwait and many more. Regardless of your gender, the military recognizes and rewards hard work and has countless opportunities for education, travel, and personal growth. I ask you to please remember the female troops when donating supplies for care packages for our deployed men and women. Operation Courage and Soldiers Angels are some of the many organizations supporting our female troops. I thank you for your attendance and attention. Does anyone have any questions? You covered everything. <laughs> thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Jerry. Very good. Very, very, very good. Thank you. Just be glad you got a chance to, to take a shower once in a while. <laughs> I didn't meet too many of them. <laughs> Uncle Sam did give you a, a special set of skills. I, I can wash anywhere with the least amount of water. Yeah. It's coming. Change your clothes over in Vietnam. Oh, when they water off your body, then you, you got a new pair of pants. I can only imagine. <laughs> Any other questions? I'm that good? Yeah. All right. <laughs> I have um, the letter up here that Barbara Bush uh, sent back to my mother, um, some brochures on the veterans program through my hospice organization, postcards about the memorial, its location and how you can become involved. And then I sent some just loose pictures and my scrapbook around as well, if you have any questions about that. It sounds like you do this all over here. Oh, I definitely would. It, 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 it was amazing. The only thing is, I wish I would have had a better camera. It, it would have been amazing to have an iPhone over there at that time. I don't know, but a little 110. Yeah, so my pictures aren't the greatest, but I try to take pictures of everything. Because like sure. I said, I, I, knew, I knew I wasn't going back. I knew this was a once in a lifetime. So I tried to snatch as many souvenirs and photos as I could. Well, we do have one question online. What advice would you give a female planning to enter the military? I would say the question. What advice would I give a, a female entering the military today? 
I would say not just females, but males too. Talk to every branch, which I did, but I had no parental guidance. I had my school guidance counselor. So it would have been nice to either talk to someone that was in the service or, or just talk to other people. I was 18, thought I knew everything and I didn't know that much. Um, so I was actually um, going to go into the Navy or no. Army full time, but the Navy was my first choice. And and a classmate said, well, why go in full time? You can do all that and only serve a weekend a month, two weeks in the summer, and still go to college on schedule. Um, so I do regret not seeking other people's advice. And pack plenty of essentials no matter where you go. <laughs> uh, you're lucky you took pictures because I didn't have any room on my pack. So when I was in Vietnam, uh, my first duty was to take the radio. So I carried about 120 pounds in my pack and on my body. So. Yeah, my father in law was, was uh, a river rat on the PBRs. Um, he was fortunate that he was able to take some amazing photos, but not nothing compared to my experience or what I did. Rivers, mm -hmm. That's very dangerous. Yeah. Army? Uh, Navy. Navy. Uh, 165 uh, combat. Yeah, um, a lot of people don't realize that John Terry was kind of really rats. I know a lot of you in this room, and I know you're not normally this quiet. <laughs> 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 okay. Uh, um, I was a 76 Yankee, which is a supply specialist, and I was with a transportation unit. So I made sure that my unit had all the supplies it needed. Um, ammunition, food, water, everything for my unit um, to function in order for my unit to be able to successfully do their transport missions. Uh, total, my unit logged um, a million miles in Desert Storm. How about Desert, uh, the uh, storms, the dust storms? Um, I have pictures of those. Yeah, um, oh, some people oh, actually oh. ask me for pictures. They, oh, can I have some copies? And, I wouldn't let them. I was like, if I, I went outside and took pictures. And <laughs> get your own. Um, for the most part. Um, <laughs> uh, for the most part, you, you could see it coming. So we would go in our tents one night. Um, in the middle of the night, though, it did take out our mess tent. Um, so we did the best we could by flashlight, uh, patching it back together until morning. Um, but for the most part, we were. We were secured in our tents, and even when it wasn't a dust storm, I mean, th there's dust everywhere. Uh, you, you you didn't get away from it. Learned about that. Just yeah, very much, act. very much so. What were you saying about the Air Force women before wearing their little pearl earrings? Uh, when when I went to um, I I believe it was KKMC. I may have that information wrong. Um, where President Bush, um came to see us while we're waiting in line. And I have to tell you, when you watch that motorcade pull up, it's pretty special. I'm in hand wash clothes, the cleanest I could try to be to see the president and these Air Force women in their beautifully clean uniforms and their ponytails and little pearl studs going to the air conditioned tent made me regret a lot of decisions at that moment. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but it's all good. It's so it's yep. I, I still had a, a pretty uh, good career, ended well. How did you get trained to become a medic? Um, well, with having to transfer out, um, one of the nearest units was a, a, a medic unit, and I was going to school to be a nurse. So I thought they were a nice fit. So, um, the National Guard sent me to uh, Fort Sam Houston in San Antonio, Texas uh, during the summer for my training. And I was able to do it during the summer so it didn't interfere with my nursing school. I think uh, one of the points you made is that it was a cut out for most of you when you got out. You had basically no support but family and friends. So yeah, that had to be hard for you to come I would say family minus friends more so than family. 
Um, my father, we had a, a barbecue, kind of a welcome home plus whatever holiday birthdays were going on. And nobody in the family was talking to me. I, I found it very odd. Do you um, think that makes it stronger? Oh, hold on. My, it turned out my, my father's brother, my uncle, had served two tours in Vietnam and was yelled at and spit on when he came home. And my father was so afraid that I was going to have this a similar experience that he told everyone in the family not to talk to me about <laughs> Desert Storm. Um, so it was a little weird. Um, but no, even, even when I had moments with my PTSD and sh struck out in anger and stuff, um, I was treated like I was still a child, still in high school, not someone that had just had these incredible good and not so good experiences. Um, I, I would say I, I mostly did it on my own just because I wasn't going to fail no matter what. You said you wanted to ride yourself. Yes, this is my most part. Of these are all my riders in the back. Thanks, guy. Explain how that came about. Um, <laughs> roundabout way. I've always wanted to ride a motorcycle. Never had the opportunity to. My husband never did. Um, so my husband used to work weekends, so I'd go out with my friend and start riding. Um, on the back of his bike, I started going to different uh, riding events, and next thing you know, I'm meeting these. <laughs> Uh, men and women and joined up and now I have my own bike and checked off a lifelong uh, bucket list at 50. Oh, really? Yeah. Does your husband swing real right? He does. He decided he wanted to join me and decided to road, ride motorcycles too. So we, we share a, a Harley Davidson trait. You can. We both do. That was the condition. If if we went in together on a bike, he had a ride cupcake. So he does. He does. Yeah, I'm trying. I'm trying to keep it G-rated. But no, we 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 take turns. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.